I think that the fact that we consider protest as one group is really is one of the reasons why the research on protests is lagging behind. Because they are so diverse that nobody can know them all, and you need several specialists to do anything on them then. So I had the chance to work with Michael Monkowski, who and is in his team who oh, yeah. aim to understand the functional significance of bell brand diversity for the whole ecosystem. So it's mostly about uh, micro soil microbe and plant interaction. And Michael Bolkowski was uh, one of the theoricians of the microbial loop. That uh, means that protists feed on bacteria in the rhizosphere, right? In the rhizosphere of the pen. And by, by this feeding, they release a menu. And this, the selective grazing of protists on bacteria favors nutrifers and, and so, yeah, several kinds of bacteria. And uh, similar molecules are released but it's bacteria and they influence uh, lateral uh, plant growth, uh, root growth. So uh, not only the protists modify the diversity of the microbiome that is in the rhizosphere, but also the root architecture. And this is about the soil food web, right? So it's very important, uh, the breakdown of the organic matter that is in the litter, the, 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 the from the, the yeah, from the vegetation or from the animals, and that has, has to be given back uh, in the soil food web. And the protists, you can see them there, uh, they are believed to eat bacteria. And this is a very simple model, because more and more we have evidence that protists are not only bacterial feeders, but they also feed on fungi, on nematodes, on other protists that they feed on fungi that you can see from this movie. Uh, this, these are my pets, the mix of the seeds. Uh, they are, this is one cell that you see there. It's a giant cell, it's a plasmodium, multinucleate. And this species, Badania utricularis, is able to digest mushrooms. Or, this is a video that has been done in my Kabokowski team. Uh, the idea was to film overnight nematodes eating amoebae, and what happened is just the opposite, is that the amoebae uh, ate the nematodes. So we have a very intricate network in the, in the, in the <coughs> soil where we have predation, feedback, uh, with the roots uh, between the protists and we are far from knowing all, even the diversity of, of all the, the players. So understanding the role of different resistant packs and functional group is essential to understand what's happening in the soil. And we still don't know basic facts. Which are the dominant packs in soil? And what are the dominant feeding models? So, we know very little about the diversity of soil protists. Uh, and the 20,000 currently described soil protists species could represent only a third of the total number. So why is it so difficult? Because the soil is opaque and direct observation is not possible. With the advent of new methods like metatranscriptomic or environmental PCR, we are open a new, a new door. So, but we still have problems because the environmental PCR has bias uh, with the primers that you use, you only get what the primer can match as sequences. Metatranscriptomic is much more promising, but at the moment it's still limited by the cost. What we know, I'm trying to summarize now the little things we know from this kind of project, metatranscriptomic or implicit. So this was one of the first using metatranscriptomics, and uh, it was only one soil sample. And you can see that bacteria dominated in soil, archaea are only marginally represented, and protists and eukaryota about 10%, not only protists, all eukaryotes. This is also a study that was done with Sanger sequencing. Um, they had like 7,000 sequences 
from 2008 in several soils, and protists in total represent 22% of the eukaryotic reeds. This is a study that uh, we did. So you have three regions in Germany, and the litter of uh, beach, one year old beach has been collected. And by metrotranscriptomic, we found that uh, the protist may represent 24%, so nearly a quarter of the diversity of the eukaryotes. And very interestingly, we found that amebozoa, and I insist on amebozoa because that's what um, Alexei and I are studying mostly, they are they represent the largest protistone group in this literature. I will come back to that later. But the proportion of each of the major protistone group can vary between environments. Huh? So, okay, we know we have 10% of eukaryote. In this eukaryote, we have quarter of protists. And which is the dominant group of protists in that percentage? That varies between environments. I don't expect you to read that, but what you can see, for example, in this study, you, ha you have like aquatic environment and soil. Uh, Circozoa seem to be one of the most important group, together with the megozoa. And the the phylum Circozoa, it's immense. So it's it's a very very large group. It's found everywhere in marine, freshwater, and especially soil ecosystem. It can encompass an array of functional traits that are, is very, very large. Like you have uh, nearly any kind of feeding mode, locomotion, and shapes. And uh, you have around 600 species that have been described, but you have many more environmental sequences that don't match this. Um, this describes species, so we think that the diversity is much larger. And yeah, and it is quite well represented by 600 uh, sequences in the database, which is very important to identify when you're doing the PCR to identify the sequence that you find in the environment. So, and now I was thinking to make a pose and then to explain. Uh, the findings of the project about Sokozoa. Is that okay or is that worry? Or shall I continue a little bit? What do you think? It's okay? Um, it's okay if you plan it like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do that because yeah. I, it's more or less half of my presentation. Okay, so for Sokozoa. Uh, we design a protocol to investigate the diversity of Circozoa in the soil or in the, in, in the environment. And uh, this protocol has been applied in several collaborative studies and those are the results that I'm going to detail now. So first, uh, our primer, do they cover the entire range of Sokozoa? So what you have here in black are the reference sequences and in red they are, are the sequences that we retrieve from the environment. So you can see that they are very well widespread in the whole range of Sokozoa. Although we have uh, three basal, basal lineages, which by the way, there is a new taxonomy and they no more Sokozoa, they are now called Endomyxa, and those, these primers didn't get them, or very little, very little Phidomyxian. But uh, since then I improved the primer and now they also match these basal parasitic lineages, which are quite interesting in the environment. Uh, what we did also, and this is going to be soon published with Kenny Dumak and David Bass, is a table where we take all the taxa for which there is a sequence, all the Sokozoan taxa for which there is a sequence, and we trade in morphology, in nutrition, and in locomotion. For example, in morphology, we distinguish first between the naked and the testate amoebae, the amoebae with shell, and in the naked, we distinguish between flagellate, amoebae, or amoeboflagellate. Uh, this is related to the, to the morphologies you find in the Sokozoa, right? And in the testate, we distinguish between the organic uh, or agglutinated test and between the silica test. 
and um, in locomotion, okay, for protistologists, I'm sorry to to show you that, but for non-protistologists, so this is the kind of locomotion where a cell swims or floats, and this is a kind of locomotion um, where a cell glides. These I mean, they are attached to the substrate. Okay. The nutrition, we want to distinguish between bacterivore, there you can see a small flagellate with, his bac with a bacterium on top, eukaryvore, that means they are eating only other eukaryotes, and omnivore, that are eating eukaryotes and bacteria as well. We cannot distinguish more because often we don't have data about that. Huh? And those are the results from two of our soil survey surveys. One uh, where we retrieve circa 700 otus and another one that is from uh, 100 samples of dry land worldwide where we retrieve 3,000 otus. And you can see that the proportion of bacterivore is nearly 60%. And but uh, contrary to the, to the general view that says proteins are only bacterivore, we still have uh, nearly 24% of omnivore. So that shouldn't be neglected when we think about the role of proteins in soil. Now, how, what can Sokozoa tell us about soil function? Let's look at the parasitic Phytomyxea. Uh, they are obligatory root parasites, they are able to form resistance spores that will stay in the root or in the soil next to the root for many years. And they have a, a dispersal flagellate state that is quite short-lived. So uh, these are results from uh, 600 samples of forest and grassland soils in Germany in two years. And this is with the improved primer that also matched the Plasmodiophorida vampirellida at the base. And you can see that we have 14% of these parasitic Sokozoan in forest and grassland. And now we want to know if those parasites, they follow uh, plant seasonality. Like are they, are they more abundant when, during, when the plant are alive or not? And this is from another study where we have, uh, we could investigate seasonal and, and, um, and uh, spatial variation. And we didn't find any statistical uh, significance um, of seasonality, influence of seasonality in these two lineages of plasma for fluorid. So the hypothesis that these parasites they build over time uh, is, is wrong. Uh, that's, the, that's the reason why you have to rotate crops at, when you're in, in cultivated land because those, the idea is that parasite, specific parasite for this plant will build over time and then they will be more aggressive for your plant. But we couldn't observe that in one year. Now let's look at morphology. So what are the proportion of the state versus naked cells in soil? Would you think that you have more testate because they are supposed to be more predator resistant or are you going to have more naked cells? So again, from the two different studies, the grassland and the 180 samples uh, in dryland worldwide, we see that we have, well, different proportion, but the naked flagellate and naked amoeboflagellate in brown and beige, they are dominating. And the testate, whether they are agglutinated or with uh, a test made of silica, in green and yellow, they are less abundant. And even in dry lands, where you may think perhaps they would be an ad advantage, no. Uh, so the, most of the Sokozoan soil, they are naked cells. And about the locomotion also, do we have you would think that in the, the soil you have, okay, grains and you have liquid in between and you could have a lot of protein swimming in that, in between the grains. Or are they just attached to the, to the, to the grain of soil and to the ivy and to the roots of the plants and they 
glide along along those substrate. So Darby Shear in 2005, he already observed that uh, they were mostly attached to the substrate and not floating, freely floating in the medium. And we found that the really overall majority of circozoa is creeping, slide, gliding on substrate in soil. We don't have that many freely swimming. And even less in dry lands, which makes sense because there is more drought and less water. So uh, what another thing that we can do with this data is to try to infer which are the well, if there is partial and temporal variation, and which are the soil factors that are more that that will influence the distribution of our of our circozoa. So these are the results from these experiments, Kalemic, which has been designed to analyze the spatial temporal diversity in a 10 square meter in a grassland in Germany. So these 10 square meter have been divided in 360 plots and sampled at six different dates. And so you have a minimum distance between plots that is 45 centimeters, maximum distance that is 12.4 meter, and six, and six different dates, okay. So we have a seasonal variation of the edific parameters and the number of bacteria. Uh, just look at the first two months, April and May. We have a high soil moisture in April and a decrease in May. And we have also a similar decrease in the number of bacteria from April to May. Now, if we look at the bacterivore, uh, Sarcozoan bacterivore families, we found more or less the same decrease from April to May. But the omnivore, we have exactly the opposite pattern. They increase in May. So this, for us, suggests a pre-predator, pre, uh, pre, predator prey um, dynamic interaction. Like the omnivore have, uh, did feed on the bacterivore and on the bacteria, and perhaps that may explain the decrease. So to study that, we, we have also data from the bacteria, from Illumina sequencing that we haven't used yet, and we are doing uh, this kind of analysis uh, with Tim Richter Eichmann from the University of Bremen. About the spe spatial diversity, so uh, we look at the spatial distance at which the Sarcozoan community are co-correlated and we found that they are co-correlated up to a distance of four meters. And they are negatively correlated from a distance from four to eight meters and they are not correlated uh, after, t after eight meters at all. So that means, because this is, a rec this is a question like, okay, I plan to do some environmental sampling of soil protist. What is the unit? Shall I sample every, every centimeter, every, every meter, every 10 meters? What so in, now we have the answer in the grassland, Every four meters, you will have co-correlated communities. So they are very similar community in, uh, in at the distance of four meters. And which are the main edaphic factor, biotic or abiotic, shaping the circozoan community? So we have the soil moisture as the main influencing factor in this grassland study, the percentage of clay, and the uh, content of uh, organic carbon and the pH which is the main factor influencing the, the, the distribution of bacterial community is actually not that important but we had a restricted gradient of pH in that grassland it was quite uh, homogeneous so we have an idea of the of the factor that are more influential in this grassland but they have opposite effects on different morphologies or families. For example, if you look at soil moisture, it is positively correlated with the naked flagellate, but is negatively correlated with the testate amimi. 
And if we look at the percentage of clay, then it's naked amoeboid flagellate that are positively correlated, but not the naked flagellate. So this makes a bit more sense. Uh, apparently, the testate amoebae, they are more resistant to drought because of the shell. So in summary, in this 10 square meter grassland, we found highly spatially and temporary structures, circozoan community, indicative of environmental filtering. Yeah, I'm sorry that I have to say that there are still some articles coming out where they say that protists are randomly distributed in the environment, which is completely wrong. Um, and it's usually, if you look in detail at this article, it's because of methodological bias that they are reaches this conclusion. So they are structured and uh, we have heterogeneous responses of taxa or functional group to the environmental parameter. We found a likely dispersion range of four meters and we unveiled a dynamic distribution of protistan diversity over space and, and time and at the scale at which it occurs. So this article is actually in review. I'd like to present another, another um, study, completely different one. It's a collaboration with a Brazilian team and they have this very interesting hypothesis. They think that if the new cultivars, so now we're talking about crops, about cultivated plants, so these new cultivars, um, they are less resistant to parasite or whatever, and they think that is because they have lost the capacity to select for uh, good helping bacteria from the roots. So this product is called back to the root, and uh, to test this hypothesis, they have a very interesting uh, design with three varieties of wheat, ancient var cultivated varieties from the 40s, the 50s, and the 70s. They have three uh, currently commercialized varieties of wheat. And they also went to Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan to look for the very ancestral wheat varieties. And they plant these varieties in soil of two different origin, an agricultural soil and a forest soil. And with the factual design plus the control, they have 96 samples. Perfect, that's a, a sequencing plate. So with, Kenny, with my colleague Kenneth Dumac, we, did, uh, we applied our Circozoan primer to these samples. And what you can see from this is that you have differences between treatments. And uh, the statistical analysis, they showed that the soil type is the most influential factor. But the plant type is also influential, so don't panic. This is a network of co-occurrence uh, between Circozoa, bacteria, and fungi. All, all these data are obtained by Illumina sequencing. And what you can see is that the old varieties, they have a more intricate network than the new varieties. And this is quite good. It, it confirms the theory that they have that the new cultivar, they are actually less able to interact with the soil organism. And what is also interesting for us is to see, uh, so you see Sokozo are, are here in red, in, um, yeah, uh, well, you can see when they are. <laughs> and you can see that you have a lot of interaction with the fungi too. Negative, both negative and positive. At this level, you cannot see. Uh, and this is something that has been done at this scale for the first time with protists and fungi and bacteria. And it's, I think, this, this kind of study are really promising to come back to our first question and understand what's happening in the soil food web. So in summary, uh, we have tools to understand our protestant community as structure and the factors shaping them. We can do in-depth statistical analysis of beta diversity, multivariate analysis with biotic and abiotic factor and network analysis. 
We can exploit the Sokozoan multifunctionality and provide detailed responses for each functional and taxonomic group. And so this can help to solve main ecological questions such as soil population dynamics, community ecology, and soil food web interactions. And I would like to thank you for your attention, thank all my collaborators in Michael Monkowski group, and the very collaborative Sokozoans because they are really easy to deal with. <laughs> and I await your questions. Yes? In the in the new cultivar, well, that's that's the well. This is, it's not my question. It's not my topic. Huh? We just collaborated with this team. But what I understood from what they they explain is that they think that by selecting more and more productive varieties you forget about what's happening in the roots and you select plants that are not able to um, that will secrete for example less products in the roots and will have a less uh, less uh, rich um, uh, community of bacteria and because they have a less rich community of bacteria you have less protein and less fungi and less interactions that's, that's the idea behind. And of course it needs more investigation, but they had these first results that are quite clear, that they are right, that the new varieties of plants, because over the years, you forget about the other traits and the other abilities of the plant, right? Yes? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question. So, are they relatives to uh, chloroarachnids? No, chloroarachnids are sucozoan. Ah, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, are there many soil uh, sucozoans uh, which are orthotropic? There are few, but not many. And chloroarachnid, I couldn't, although my primers matched them, I couldn't find them in soil. Oh, but I wasn't. Fresh water. Uh, I wasn't surprised not to find them in soil. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there are few others. Uh, you have the famous uh, Polinella, which has a very recent endosymbiosis. Uh, and is slightly photosynthetic. And is photosynthetic. And I found it in the in the soil. Yes. Yes. The, sec the, the second question I uh, uh, the bacteria was uh, <coughs> uh, so uh, what do they uh, what are they planted by in August? Uh, there was a scheme scheme where uh, the amount of bacteria. Ah, we may want to come back to that. Then uh, let's let's try to do that. Mm. Uh, no, here. Here. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, that's why we only, okay, that was, those were very rough evaluation. Uh -huh. So they, they took the soil sample and they counted the number of bacteria under the microscope. That's why I want to stick only to the first two months that really show a decrease. After we had, we had other, they also did PLFAs, etc. So those are, it's a collaborative project, so those are not all data. So I, I can talk about what I found in the Circozoa. The bacteria, we rely on other people data and we found that some of these data were not available. But we have now the Illumina sequencing of the bacteria and that, and there we're going to analyze the two data, the two set of data together, and we're going to have better answers to the question what happens to them in August in, uh, and in September and in October, yes. So that was not actually the real amount of the period? No. That's, that's something very rough. It has been counted under the microscope. That's the only thing I can tell you. So uh, only, uh, uh, that's the only, uh, 
a way to show the process, but not really uh, something numbered. It's like, okay, let's say it's a collaborative project. You get things from the other people. Uh -huh. You look at them and you say, what can I do with them? No? <laughs> you have a collaboration going on and you say, okay, I found something interesting that this, this decrease. The rest, I don't know what to do with it. This decrease is interesting. But we're going to, we're going to have uh, Illumina sequencing of all bacteria and that's going to be more reliable than just counting bacteria or, or looking at PLFA because PLFA can also be um, biased especially for bacteria. It's more reliable for fungi. Uh -huh. And uh, about uh, the test states, mm -hmm. uh, what are they usually made from? From silica? Si uh, okay, you have, you have some groups that are made of silica mm -hmm. and some that have an organic test, so it's secreted by the cell itself. Mm -hmm. And some they also, we put them together because it's only if you have an, uh, this organic test that you can also agglutinate stuff from the environment on the test. So those tests, they look like uh, made of little, little stones or whatever, little grains, right? So those are the agglutinated tests. But we put them together because um, to, be to have an agglutinated test, you need to have an organic test. You cannot, have an, uh, you cannot agglutinate it only on your membrane, right? But the silica, we put them in a different group because um, we think that you, to build a silica test, you need to find silica in the environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so they may, and so without the, this kind of analysis, it could be they could reveal interesting patterns too. But silica parts uh, from sand parts could be agglutinated by. Uh, uh, agglutinated in a, into a test state uh, of, uh, of uh, organic test state. Yeah, yeah, sure. They, they agglutinate anything, what yeah. they found. Uh, yeah, right? What about uh, the carbonate test states? We don't have that ah. in, uh, in Soko Zone. Ah. No. Uh, thank you. <laughs> mm. Lena. So you mentioned that the proportion of parasitic lineages are rather small uh, in monkey or weeds. And uh, okay, was it because of the primers? Um, uh, but still, you designed the primers specially targeted for phytoemics. Yeah, I. S no, no, no. They not. They not design specialized. So we had first we had primer that were biased against phytoemixia. And so the results I showed, for example, from the, um, from the 10 square meter grassland, those are with this primer. But then we, did, then we designed them and we can find in these, yeah, here are the new primers. So this is with Circus 1 primer and you can see that we find the plasmodiophorida, which are the plant parasite, and we find also the vampirellid, which were completely excluded by the other primer, and those are very interesting Sokozoa. They are called vampirellids because they, they attach themselves to algae and they suck the algae inside the, um, the cell. No? And they become orange, that's why they're called vampirellids. And so those we find them now with the primers, 11%, that's quite a, that's quite a lot, isn't it? It's a quarter of all. So yeah, uh, a quarter of also Kozoa, the the basic yes, the basic lineages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when at the beginning you mentioned the proportion of proteins. Uh, yeah, that was from metatranscriptomic. So one of the at the very beginning. Yeah, that's. But that's from metatranscriptomics, um, right? So that's not with the primer bias, that's with all the RNAs. And it's in litter, and it's not in soil. Huh? So you, I didn't catch, sorry. So you think what is mainly because of the primer bias? No, there's no primer there. This is metatranscriptomics. Ah. 
it's just RNAs, uh, it's without those primer. Mm. Yeah, it's ribo those are the ribosomal RNA. Mm. Once again, <laughs> Once a, a quarter of the eukaryotic diversity in the litter is protist. Mm -hmm. And uh, about one type small um, <coughs> question about this uh, VH uh, liter. So, when, what exactly, what fraction exactly uh, did you use for DNA extraction? Uh, that I didn't do. We got, um, that's a, again, this is a collaborative project. We didn't do the extraction ourselves. Uh, it's all described, they, they have published. This is Marco, you have to look at Marco Guerrero and Derek Perso. They have published already two articles about them with the, the, the method described, etc. To us, they only gave the the ribosomal uh, sequences they have no use of because they, they were looking at the at functional genes. They had also a very interesting theory about the, the, the they were looking at fungi, the diversity of fungi with functional genes. And so they gave us the leftover that were these ribosomal sequences and say let if if you want you can do something with it. And so we did something with it. <laughs> I had a student working on it and uh, no, it's just interesting because, in principle, if it's, uh, it should these samples should contain a lot of plant DNA. And yeah, I think they they deleted the sequences of the fungus DNA because there is not a single sequence of fungus DNA. That's a question I asked uh, last week to Marco, and I'm waiting for his answer. But uh, they have deleted the the sequence of the fungus. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So the the plant that you have is anything but fungus. I mean, just the proportion of DNA is so I mean, you should have in this sample a huge disproportion of DNA, so you, you have Yeah, but you can DNA filter... Just a tiny fraction of everything else, and you are not interested in this... Yeah, I think I think if you if you are not, if you want to see the diversity that you have in the litter of fungus, you will delete the sequences of fungus before you analyze the diversity. No, otherwise you will. No? I suppose so. I don't know now. Perhaps they made also a method where they excluded. Uh, you know, you have this clamped PCR where you exclude the sequence of fungus. You don't amplify it at all. So those you, but I don't know what they what they did because, as I said, we got the sequences. We did only bioinformatic works there. Mm. Interesting question. Okay. Mm. It's maybe a technical matter, but still. Yeah. Well, I we have we have to look at the articles together if you want. We can know the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Another question here. Those environmental, unturned environmental guys. So, how do you know that they are, for instance, bacterivores in the first place? Sorry? Uh, ah, bacterivores. Yeah. Yes, so okay. How, how you assign this in, uh, yeah, okay. In we compiled this table, and this is also an article in prep <laughs> that uh, will be submitted soon. We, com we just look at the literature and uh, my colleague Kenny, he does a lot of culturing of the Kozoa, so he also added his own experience. Sometimes it contradicted the literature. Now, the proportion of bacterivore may be overestimated because when you isolate a species, you usually feed it with bacteria. If it works, you see, you, you, you write down it is a bacterivorous, but it actually may eat also other stuff, right? But since in the lab you mostly will feed it with E. coli, then you think it's going to eat E. coli. So the proportion of bacterivore is overestimated, I think. I think. But we compiled this table, so that was a lot of work. We compiled this table by looking at the original description of each of these taxa and um, and also at, at new articles that would perhaps describe the way they were, they were feeding. And for many things we don't know because it wasn't described and yeah.
So you, you leave them on, on a side, you basically don't use this? Uh, yeah, we have plenty of not known in our table. We have plenty of not uh, an A or not known or whatever. We have plen plenty of things like that. We're not going to invent anything. <laughs> Yeah, but that, that was a work in itself, but I think it, it's very useful and that's why we want to publish the table because it helps making sense of, of your data because otherwise you do environmental sampling, you, you blast your sequence, you get a list of names and that's it, right? And, but if you, get, you, if you get a list of bacteria or omnivore or gliding or swimming, then you can do a little bit more out of it. Uh, Anna Marie, thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, uh, we very well know that uh, liter supply is very rich in fungus forest, yes? But what's the part of the layer of uh, liter did you use? I didn't, I, it's not something I did. They, they took, I think it's very well described, they took one year old leaves and they cut circles in it and they extract the DNA from that. Because it's sometimes about one meter. No, it's never one meter. Yeah, no. I have met several, many times in such forests. I mean the top. Well, top. in Germany, it, uh, it, I think the turnover is quite fast, yeah. so. About half or 30? No, they took the one oh, year. Total, total. I don't, I don't know, it's never that high. In, in Germany, it's never that high. It, it's it's uh, entirely recycled every year. Uh -huh. Suggested that if somebody else has questions left, uh, we can leave them for maybe some uh, private talk. And meanwhile, I would just like to thank the speaker for this story. Thank you. Thank you.